Um, so, yeah, I'm Catherine Irons, um, and I keep being referred to as one of the co-organisers. I'm going to say more like I helped with the programme, the organisation. Um, I'm really, really grateful for Petra in conjunction with Wilma Hale to do all that physical, <laughs> wonderful uh, coordinating um, and getting this going behind the scenes. Um, so um, I'm just stepping in um, to, uh, to really uh, to run this next panel, um, Lord Carnworth's um, keynote and then four panel speakers. I'm delighted to be able to do so. Really delighted um, uh, to have um, got Lord Carnworth's agreement um, to speak uh, here today. You may know him as a Justice of the Supreme Court here in the UK. M uh, most of the rest of the world um, knows, have seen him in his judicial education, um, particularly in relation to environmental judging that he's um, undertaken around the world. Um, and that's, in, that's the context in which I've met him twice overseas. Um, in the Rio um, Congress from the World Commission on Environmental Law, the inaugural um, Congress on the Environmental Rule of Law, and then in New Zealand at a New Zealand Environmental Judging um, Conference. He's done a huge amount um, in this area of uh, training other judges, um, and not just judges, but other people around the world in relation to environmental aspects of judging. Um, so we're delighted, and I'm not going to say anything about his bio, his distinguished judicial career, that's before you. It just doesn't mention the other stuff that he's done around the world for the World Commission on Environmental Law. So I thought I'd better add that one in there. Um, so uh, he's going to talk um, on one particular aspect of envir uh, things that are something that's particularly relevant to the resolution of international environmental disputes or any environmental disputes, and that's how do you deal with scientific uncertainty. So we've, we've heard from a lot of scientists and non-lawyers. We've heard some wider pictures of uh, international issues in particular, and now we're going to start focusing on some of the more particular issues to dispute resolution. Solution. And um, his uh, main topic is the use of the precautionary principle and the development of the precautionary principle as one of those tools that you do um, to address uh, scientific uncertainty in law. So I'm going to hand it over to Lord Carnworth now to address you, and then I'll come up to introduce the other speakers um, after that. And yes, you may sit at the table or stand. That's your choice. Thank you very much, and I'll leave them to organise the speakers. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very honoured to be invited to speak. Um, I wasn't very clear quite what my brief was going to be, and having heard the very distinguished session this morning, I'm even less clear in the sense that you've heard so much really expertise on the legal structures and so, and, but particularly on the scientific background. Um, that talking about sort of evidence in the context of dispute resolution is um, quite a, a difficult subject without sort of going into the nitty gritty, which is what's going to happen, I think, in the next few sessions. So I think I have a sort of link link role. Um, the uh, I should perhaps I mean my credentials to speak at a small states conference, I suppose, should include the fact that I'm a judge of the Privy Council. Um, it's perhaps not so often realised that the Supreme Court also includes the jurisdiction as a final appeal court for a number of smaller Commonwealth jurisdictions, including Mauritius. And Mauritius, I mean, I'm certainly aware of the code is in French, that we have the interesting task of interpreting uh, a French code um, using decisions of the French courts on the interpretation of what was the Napoleonic Code. Uh, we also have the final appellate jurisdiction from the Cook Islands, which has also been mentioned. Uh, indeed, the first case I ever did in the Supreme Court was a um, dispute about um, property title in the, um, based on customary law in the Cook Islands, which was a new one on me. But, so it's, um, we have a broad spread. Uh, it's also been mentioned that I have been involved uh, with the United Nations Environment Programme for a number of years in the initiatives of trying to um, improve judicial understanding of environmental law uh, across the world. And that was a sort of initiative which came out of the Johannesburg um, Global Judges Symposium, as it was called in 2002. 
Um, there's also been mentioned of the Global Pact, um, which uh, Elizabeth Moema spoke about. I mean, quite where it's going, I'm not sure. I was one of the so-called experts who was summoned to Paris um, a year or so ago by Laurent Fabius, um, who had chaired the Paris climate change negotiations and had this idea of the initiative of creating this global pact, and we spent a day sort of working through it, um, followed by a tremendous launch event at the Sorbonne, um, at which President Macron spoke with great force. But also, rather well, surprised to me, the other star of the occasion was Arnold Schwarzenegger, who <laughs> um, you may know as a Terminator, but actually um, a great champion of the movement uh, against uh, to combat climate change, having been governor of uh, California um, and a, a, an ardent opponent of Professor Trump. Um, and he was very funny on that subject, I must say. But <laughs> anyway, um, the subject I was given was evidence and dispute resolution. But um, in a way, the sort of premise of that is that, uh, ever, that dispute resolution is going to be evidence-based. Um, and we heard that there's plenty of evidence around, in fact, extraordinary knowledge of the scientific basis of climate change and how its effects. But um, a, a intense frustration that that doesn't seem to sort of work through to the, the, the policymakers. Um, David Bagranath mentioned the speech of the Prime Minister of Samoa in Australia uh, a week or so ago, um, I picked up a report in The Guardian in which um, he was reported as having said that any world leader who denied climate change existence should be taken to a mental hospital. Um, now, he didn't mention any names, but it was fairly obvious who he was talking about. Um, and it did underline the sort of the sheer irrationality of climate change denial. Um, it took me back to um, another thing mentioned by David Bagranath, which was a conference I helped to organize in 2015 in London on, um, it, it under the title Adjudicating the Future, Climate Change and the Rule of Law. And the idea was to assemble a group of specialist judges and practitioners and academics to look at the legal issues arising from climate change and how they might be dealt with in the courts. And one session which has been mentioned, and um, David gave the reference to it, was a, a lecture by Professor Philippe Sands, who many of you will know. That was hosted by me at the Supreme Court. Uh, and he was looking at the international law aspects of climate change and how the, the international legal community could get to grips with that. And um, he considered the possible role of the International Court of Justice um, in helping to settle the scientific debate on climate change and the responsibilities arising from it. And one idea he discussed was that an island state directly affected by rising sea levels might persuade the UN General Assembly to make a reference to the ICJ for an advisory opinion on the legal obligations of nation states in respect of climate change. Now, I mean, an interesting suggestion, probably perhaps not practical, but anyway, the, uh, the lecture was published, was broadcast live on the Supreme Court website. Uh, now, I hadn't heard of Breitbart News then, We've all heard of it now, but um, shortly after the event, I was alerted by our press office to a Breitbart article under the title, The Stupid Scary Plan to Outlaw Climate Change. Um, and there was a similar article a little later by the same author in the London Spectator. The burden of the article was that I and my fellow judges were, quotes, cooking up a scheme to close the argument on climate change forever by using, quotes, the sledgehammer instrument of the International Court of Justice, thus leading to an effective global ban on the discussion of the issues. The Breitbart piece ended with the comment, Sands is a dangerous man, even more so the man who instigated the conference, a hitherto obscure activist judge called Lord Carnworth. 
and that was me. It, 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 it sort of, um, I certainly hadn't been aware of that. Now, the article was, of course, complete nonsense. There could be no question of us as judges cooking up a scheme to use the International Court of Justice to do anything. Under the Sand suggestion, a, a request for an advisory opinion would come not from any judicial body, but from the UN General Assembly at the suit of an interested state. And in any event, as you know, the ICJ is concerned with legal obligations between nation states, not with the rights of individuals to say what they like. Um, so it was nonsense. But what the article failed completely to address was the main point of the lecture, which was about evidence and dispute resolution. As Sands put it, one of the most important things an international court could do, um, in my view, it is probably the single most important thing it could do, is to settle the scientific dispute. A finding of fact by the ICJ would be of great authority in proceedings before other international courts and tribunals and before national courts. And he had been encouraged by the increased willingness of the ICJ to engage with evidence, as shown by its then recent ruling in the Japan's, uh, in the way of Japan whaling case. Um, he commented, the judgment was given in the face of sharply differing opinions in the scientific community of the International Whaling Commission. A less robust court might have concluded that there was no settled view on the matter, and it was not for the court to take a view. The ICJ did not follow that path. That it chose to engage with the competing scientific claims is much to its credit. Remarkably, this was the first case ever in which there was cross-examination of the scientific experts put forward by Australia and Japan. In earlier cases, he said, the Hungarian dams case uh, on harm to the Danube and in the pulp mills case between Argentina and Uruguay on alleged pollution of the Uruguay River, scientific experts acted as counsel and were not subject to cross-examination or questioning by the court. In Sand's view, such examination and questioning were the key to the court reaching the conclusions it did. Now, um, uh, that said, it was all pre-Trump. Sand's idea that a judicial determination of this issue could assist the debate on climate change seems all too remote. Because there is now little serious disagreement on the facts, but it seems to make no difference. It is notable that in none of the cases that have come to the courts in the US or elsewhere has there been any serious challenge to the scientific case for man-made climate change and its consequences. In the great case in the Supreme Court in 2007, the Mass Environmental Protection Agency and Massachusetts, the majority in upholding the challenge referred to global warming as the most pressing environmental challenge of our time. The minority did not question that view or the evidence on which it was based, but simply thought the issues were non-justiciable. Now, that position on the evidence has not been challenged in later cases, even since the election of President Trump. President Trump made no attempt and apparently felt no need to justify his decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement by reference to a scientific case. Nor is there anything on the EPA website to explain or justify its pulling back from the endangerment finding which was the foundation of its actions under the Obama administration. So the theme of Philip Sands's talk, that somehow a scientific, a rational approach to science might advance this cause, is, um, has all sorts of problems. But I think um, the theme which uh, the rest of my talk is going to be about is really how the, these issues can be addressed because I think what Sands was emphasizing was that for the first time the International Court of Justice has actually been engaging in a practical way with the resolution of scientific issues um, by and with cross-examination. Now I can't claim any great expertise on this and you'll be hearing from others later who can but um, my admirable judicial assistants did some research while I was away on holiday and came up with all sorts of rather interesting articles, uh, which I'm not going to spend time on, but I have references if you want them. But one thing that did come out of that, which I did find quite interesting, was the place of the so-called precautionary principle in assessing evidence. How, what sort of standard you apply in deciding of the level of proof. Because the traditional approach in domestic and international courts 
is to put the onus on the claimant. He who asserts must prove. This was the approach adopted in the famous 1930s trail smelter dispute between USA and Canada, in which the tribunal had to consider damage to crops in Washington state allegedly caused by sulfur dioxide emissions from British Columbia. The tribunal insisted on a standard of, quote, clear and convincing, convincing evidence, which in the event it did find established. But that was very much based on a, the context of a uh, treaty which required it to apply the United USA practice along with international law, and they followed the approach of a US Supreme Court case. But more than 50 years later, in 1997, a similar approach was adopted by the ICJ in the Hungarian Dams case, which uh, Philippe Sands mentioned. There, the court had to consider whether Hungary's suspension of a joint hydroelectric power project with Slovakia in breach of a 1977 treaty was justified by a state of ecological necessity. Um, now, there was a, a mass of scientific evidence, but in the end, the case was decided on the basis that the scientific evidence was in, inconclusive, showing only a possibility of environmental harm rather than the, quote, imminent peril necessary to show a state of necessity. Now, that approach took no account of the development of general principles of international environmental law in the meantime, such as expressed in the 1992 Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. And there one has the most often quoted statement of the precautionary principle, principle 15. In order to protect the environment, the precautionary approach shall be widely applied by states according to their capabilities, where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage Lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. Now, there's an obvious tension between that um, approach to uncertainty and the requirement for convincing proof. Now, um, I was very interested to see that in 1995, in the nuclear test case in the ICJ, Judge Weir Amantri, in a, um, a dissenting opinion, had argued for a precautionary approach. I don't know whether you know about Judge Weir Amantri. He was a very remarkable Sri Lankan judge in the International Court of Justice who gave an extraordinary concurring judgment on environmental matters in, in one, of the, one of the cases where he describes the whole development of, envi of the environment and environmental protection through, sort of, through the ages. Um, it's an extraordinary document. And I was privileged um, to, to work with him on one of the early um, working groups we had in the United Nations Environment Programme to produce a uh, judicial handbook on environmental law. Anyway, what he said on this subject was this. Where a party complains to the court of possible environmental damage of an irreversible nature, which another party is committed or threatening to commit, the proof or disproof of the matter alleged may present difficulty to the claimant, as the necessary information may be largely be in the hands of the party causing or threatening the damage. The law cannot function in protection of the environment unless a legal principle is, involved, is evolved to meet this evidentiary difficulty and environmental law has responded with what has come to be described as the precautionary principle. Now, that seems to me a fairly lone view at that time, but the issue came before the ICJ more directly in the Pulp Mills case, which uh, in 2010, uh, which um, there Argentine, Argentina had brought proceedings against Uruguay, arguing that its authorization of the construction and operation of pulp mills on the river Uruguay breached its obligations laid down in the 1975 Statute of the River Uruguay, a bilateral treaty. Now, that included duties relating to the preservation of the ecological balance and the prevention of pollution. Argentina argued that the 1975 Statute adopted a precautionary approach, which the effect of which was that it was up to each party to persuade the court of their respective cases so that the burden of proof lay on Uruguay to establish that the planned mill would not cause significant damage to the environment. So a sort of straight reversal of the traditional burden. 
Now, um, the ICJ did not accept the argument in that form, although they did go on as far as to comment that, quotes, a precautionary approach may be relevant in the interpretation and application of the provisions of the statute, but it does not follow that it operates as a reversal of the burden of proof. Um, well, that's very helpful, but it doesn't say actually what it does do. So one wonders where it comes in. Now, in that case, the court was faced with a mass of conflicting scientific evidence on the environmental effects of the mill, and in the end, um, they decided that the substantive claim had not been proved. But a number of judges expressed concerns about the way in which the court had approached these issues, and some saw it as a missed opportunity to confirm the existence of general environmental princi law principles of prevention and precaution. One particular judge, Judge Trinidad, said the court had, quotes, a unique occasion in the circumstances of the case of the pulp mills to assert the applicability of the preventive as well as the precautionary principles. It unfortunately preferred not to do so for reasons which go, go beyond and escape my comprehension. And that was strong words. But um, the, so there the matters stand at the ICJ level. Um, the, um, the, the subject of, of cross-examination of scientific witnesses was, did come up as well. Judge Greenwood, the uh, highly respected British judge, um, was concerned by the fact that um, much of the scientific evidence was given by the advocates without cross-examination. And he said, as seemed obvious to a common law lawyer, the distinction between the evidence of a witness or expert and the advocacy of counsel is fundamental to the proper conduct of the litigation. Um, and he noted with approval the court's uh, clear indication that the practice would not be repeated in the future. Now, um, some of the commentators have drawn an unfavorable contrast between the court's approach of the ICJ and the more flexible approach of the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. Uh, for example, in the Blue Fin case, um, the tribunal was faced with allegations that Japan had been exceeding unlawfully its total allowable annual catch under the 1993 Convention for the Conservation of Southern Bluefish Tuna. Japan maintained that its catch was for the purpose of scientific research uh, outside the terms of the Convention. Um, Australia and New Zealand commenced uh, arbitration proceedings and applied to it clause for provisional measures. Court was faced with diametrically opposed expert opinions on several critical issues, but in eventually it granted an order along the lines sought by Australia and New Zealand. And although it didn't refer to the precautionary principle, the recitals of the order make clear that he was position was based on the position of scientific uncertainty in which it was necessary to preserve the rights of the parties and avert further deterioration. Now, obviously, that to some extent was in the context of a, a special case about provisional measures, but it has been seen as um, a, a development of the precautionary principle further than the ICJ was willing to go, and that was effectively acknowledged by Judge Wolfram, the then president of Idlos, in comments to the International Law Commission in 2008, where he referred to the failure of the ICJ jurisprudence to adopt the precautionary approach um, and showed and acknowledged that the tribunal had, um, in effect, gone further, although effectively limiting the difference to what was required for the particular case. Um, a more explicit endorsement by ITLOS comes in the 2011 advisory opinion on the seabeds dispute, um, where, the, um, again, the issue came up indirectly and to some extent depended on the terms of the particular uh, treaties in question. But the, um, the chamber did discuss the general significance of the precautionary principle and um, added that it 
the precautionary approach has been incorporated into a growing number of international treaties and other instruments, many of which reflect the formulation of Principle 15 of the Rio Declaration. In the view of the Chamber, this has initiated a trend towards making this approach part of customary international law. This trend is clearly reinforced by the inclusion of the precautionary approach in the regulations. So there matters stand, in a way, at the international level. But it's perhaps also worth mentioning the uh, case law of the um, WTO, where these sort of disputes are likely to come up more often, because um, in a, a relatively early case concerning the EC measures on meat and meat products under the WTO sanitary and phytosanitary agreement, the um, European community had prohibited the import and sale uh, of meat treated with certain growth hormones, relying on the provisions of the treaty which allow measures re required for uh, to protect life and health. And um, although uh, the defence ultimately failed before the WTO appellate body because the um, EC had failed to produce adequate evidence of a, a full risk assessment. The, um, the, the appellate body did acknowledge the potential relevance of the precautionary principle. Uh, it said this, the status of the precautionary principle in international law continues to be the subject of debate among academics, law practitioners, regulators and judges. The precautionary principle is regarded by some as having crystallised into a general principle of customary international law. Whether it has been widely accepted by members of the principle of general or customary international law appears less than clear. It appears to us important, nevertheless, to note some aspects of the relationship of the precautionary principle to the, uh, to the SBS agreement. A panel charged with determining, for instance, whether sufficient scientific evidence exists to warrant the maintenance by a member of a particular SBS measure may, of course, and should bear in mind that responsible representative governments commonly act from perspectives of prudence and precaution where risks of reversible, of irreversible, e.g. life terminating damage to health, are concerned. So um, that's a very, very quick survey of a, a very interesting topic, which I suspect there will be more developments. Um, I've come to the end of my time, but I give the last word to... Uh, 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 a valuable article by Professor Alan Boyle and James Harrison called Judicial Settlement of International Environmental Disputes, Current Problems. That was in 2013 um, uh, in the Journal of International Dispute Settlement. And I think was triggered by the response to the Park Mills case and the, the judgment in the seabed case. And it said this, um, of the use of the precautionary principle in the Park Mills case. The best view on the point may be that Argentina would have lost on the evidence whatever the standard of proof, and the court had no need to decide what standard to apply. Other cases may not be so easily decided, however, so the question of what standard of proof applies in environmental cases will not go away. Setting the standard too high is especially problematic when it is the risk of harm rather than the harm itself that has to be proved. There is no point in saying that states have an obligation of due diligence to take preventative measures, but only if there is clear and convincing proof of harm. Countering that view is precisely the reason for adopting the precautionary approach. So, um, as they acknowledge, the existing practices in international environmental litigation are far from settled. Indeed, they go far as to describe them as, quotes muddling through. But um, there's clearly a, a very important issue in which certainly um, my view would be that the precautionary principle has an important place to play. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord Conworth.